I nominated Dr. Steve Souter for the Faculty Hall of Fame. Steve and I team taught a course since 1978. We, we ventured out into something that not too many professors do, and he was, uh, like me, interested in doing something different in the classroom. And it's very rare for people to team teach, and it's a great experience for students, it's especially since Steve and I come from two very separate disciplines, mine in the humanities and he in the social sciences. And I must say, I learned a great deal from him. I don't know if he learned anything from me, but we had a good time uh, adjusting to each other, uh, enhancing each other's disciplines and sharing uh, insights. Uh, we taught this course, it started out, I believe, calling it Brain and Human Values. And then it morphed into another thing and finally is still on the books as personhood. And it gives students credit in psych and in the humanities, the, both the C and the D. And it was a great experience. And of course, Steve has done many other things. He, he of course, was among the first faculty to come to the campus. Uh, and he was instrumental. He had, a, I believe, a six-year program, summer program, NSF for the students. He was always promoting research. Um, his field was uh, first the biofeedback. He had a biofeedback lab and was doing a lot of research with students in biofeedback, and that led him to go to NASA. And I'm sure he's going to talk about that, where he did biofeedback to help the, with the space motion sickness. So he brought great research skills as well as teaching skills uh, to the campus. Uh, and then he, he, he and his uh, wife, Penny, started a vision lab and did a lot of work on vision uh, and obviously gave the students a great experience in doing research in that area. And I know he is, was instrumental in developing the lab facilities for psych. He was instrumental in developing some courses, the cognitive psych course, the brain and consciousness course, and some others. And I just think he's so worthy of being a faculty hall of fame person because he contributed so much to the campus uh, in teaching in research in collegiality uh, he was always a very collegial colleague uh, and my years with him were just great and so i think he's worthy of the nomination i'm very proud to be able to nominate um this is a great honor to be nominated by Jackie Kegley, of all people, to be in the uh, CSUB Faculty Hall of Fame after all the things that she's contributed. And I'm very uh, grateful to be nominated by her and selected by the committee. I started thinking earlier today how, I, how it came to this. And my first thought was when I first visited the campus, almost everybody else who, who's around who got hired at CSUB visited the campus during an interview. Well, there was no campus to visit when I was interviewed. They, they were building it. So I got here and I was staying at my, my motel on Union Avenue. That was the place to stay at that time was Union Avenue, the motels. And I thought I would drive out to check out the campus and I got to a chain link fence and a locked gate. And I, and I got to watch the construction workers. Uh, this was in August of 1970, working on the place. I mean, that was really my first, my first kind of memory. I, I, you know, I have some physical memories like that. Um, the, the courtyard area in the middle of the campus used to fill up with tumbleweeds. And I captured one one day in the 1970s and kept it. And uh, last year, I got an email from a student who wanted from way back, and he wanted me to do a letter of recommendation for him. And I, I said, sure. He said, hey, doc, do you still have the tumbleweed? Because I kept it in my office. And I said, yeah. So I'm, I'm talking from Glenside, Pennsylvania, and I still have it. And it's a, it's a nice one. It's a, it's a good sized tumbleweed. But in, in between uh, the chain, the lock chain link fence and uh, today, I, I, I kind of think of major 
major things that occupied my, my time uh, in addition to teaching. Well, maybe I should talk about teaching first. One of the things that um, I know it's probably striking to Dr. Kegri also is that we have had so many first generation students and uh, and also in the early days we had many we called them returning students and they were both very well they're all you know interesting people to kind of get to know they're a little bit different than your fresh out of local high school 19 year old students it's it's uh so that's been really interesting and rewarding. And I think we have a, an awful lot of impact. I mean, I've always enjoy, uh, enjoyed advising students. Also, some people think that's maybe a bit of a pain, but I always uh, found that kind of rewarding. I like to teach introductory psychology. I did that for many years because the students there were all new and fresh and like, like empty vessels to be filled and everything was just amazing to them you know, that you could that you would talk about and then maybe at the other end i spent a lot of time working one-on-one -on -one with students in a research setting and uh, they too it, it was fun to see them drink things in except it was at a different level uh, my research i got interested in psychology the science of psychology and my research has always involved a bunch of electronic equipment and then later on computers and and small rooms and mysterious electronic uh, processing going on and electrodes on people's heads and uh, but but students uh, come into that setting and they don't know anything about uh, any of the equipment they know knew very little about what goes on in biofeedback or visual processing and they would learn all that and we would work together for hours and hours and weeks and weeks and co-author papers and, and they would act as collaborators and i never told them they were mostly undergraduates i never told them that i was getting them to do things that it's usually phd students who do that in graduate programs i just didn't tell them and and they would go ahead and read read papers and we would talk about what was important in them and we talk about how to analyze data what we should look for and and then after we analyze it what did it all mean and we would spend time with stuff like that so anyway i really enjoyed enjoyed all of that um i also thought about what did along the way what did i really contribute and I was thinking about that different ways did I do anything that somebody else couldn't have done or that was special and the only thing that I could really think of is that I I think I tended to bring good spirits to the classroom and students appreciated that uh, even though the material might be difficult they they did not feel particularly intimidated and they felt that uh, that they would be uh, they were open open to participate and i and i did maintain a certain level of of humor i i, I remember one student later on told me and i was pretty good at judging when i could joke with the student and when i shouldn't and uh, she said, oh, Dr. Cedar, I have a question. She asked a question. And, uh, and I said, because I, I kind of knew her anyway, I said, well, uh, you know, th they have this saying that there's there are really no stupid questions, but I stand corrected, actually. And, <laughs> and she reacted fine to that, because I knew that I was picking on the right, the right person there. Um, anyway, but I, I think I tended to bring the, that, those good spirits to uh, it with the National Science Foundation grants that Dr. Kegley mentioned. I spent quite a bit of time going out to the high schools and giving talks in science classes to recruit students. 
applicants for these summer programs where they would come out to the university and do research. And I developed a lot of contacts uh, in the high schools. Um, that eventually developed, or those contacts let me develop yearly psychology field days that we had at the university where we would just invite students to come out and then other people in psychology would do presentations. And then that gradually expanded to behavioral science field days. And that was in the probably the late 1970s, early 80s. I remember one time I was standing up on the, the bridge, we call it, in Dorothy Donahoe Hall, looking down, doing the opening, hi, how you doing, thing. And the whole central hallway was filled. I think we had 700 students, high school students that time, was full of students. And they were getting ready to disperse to different classrooms to hear presentations from, oh, probably, you know, we had maybe 20 or 30 different classrooms going for them to pick up, uh, pick up things. Later, when I was the research ethics review coordinator, I, I spent from 1999 onward coordinating protection of human and animal research subjects. At some universities, and, and it may be more common than, than unusual, there's an adversarial kind of relationship between people who protect subjects and people who do research with those subjects. Uh, that was, was not true at, at CSUB. And, and I think I contributed to that to having a kind of welcome, welcoming collaborative atmosphere. And I had a lot, of, a lot of faculty would come to my office and get advice about writing up their protocols and, and things. Um, <laughs> remembering some of our earliest vision research involved babies, where we were studying vision development of very young babies, uh, as young as three weeks old. And we would put electrodes on their head and measure brain activity while, really, while they're, while they're uh, looking at things and we could figure out what their acuity was because we couldn't say which is better, one or two, you know, to develop, to develop acuity. But at that time, the Bakersfield Californian had marriage announcements and birth announcements right underneath that. Those were the good old days. And, and we would cut those out of the newspaper and then look up phone numbers. And then when we needed six week old babies, I was the recruiter, I would get on the phone and I would just do cold calls. And it was almost always moms and, and say, you know, hi, this is uh, Dr. Suter. I'm working, uh, the, have a grant from the National Institutes of Health and we're studying development of vision in babies. And I wonder if, and some of them would say, oh, come on, this is, this is a friend of Harold's from the office, right? You know, or you're, you're going to sell me magazines. You know, and I would get past that and then uh, explain what it was about. Excuse me. And almost always the moms would, the moms and sometimes dad would come along, would bring their little baby, baby out. And they would get a nice Polaroid picture of themselves. Uh, strip of paper that had the baby's brainwave recordings on it and uh, an absolutely free parking pass for that day at the university. But uh, anyway, I think, I think the good spirits maybe helped out a little bit, a little bit there. Um, the team teaching with Jackie, Jackie, uh, drew me into the Carnegie Foundation Science Humanities Convergence Project in the late 1970s that she was, she was coordinating that and wondered if I wanted to be involved. And eventually it turned out we, we were a, a good match for a course. And, and 
Dr. Kegley explained what those courses were about, but we literally, I, I mean, we interacted in the classroom a lot and not just learn from each other, but, but I think the two of us together were added up to something that was a little bit more than if we were doing that separately. I mean, we literally converged. Science and humanities converge right there in front of the students. And I think many of them picked up on that. Um, that led, that became sometimes, sometimes an honors course, and then that led to me being on the honors council when Dr. Kegley took over. Uh, when she became director of the Helen Hawk Honors Program, when I helped out with some things in the honors program uh, later on. Uh, Vision Lab, as, as Dr. Kegley said, was really, really fun stuff. The early 1980s, the late Ed, Ed Sazaki helped put together the Vision Lab and the other Dr. Suter and myself uh, were, the, were the founders. And we did so much research over the, over the years working with students. And I remember not just the research and going to meetings and stuff. One thing that stands out is uh, there's an international vision conference once a year in, in Fort Lauderdale. And for a while, we had the Bakersfield Beach Party. There were enough of us uh, involved in vision research at uh, the Vision Lab in Bakersfield and enough of our graduates that are, had kind of spread out into other programs and were working on PhDs and were elsewhere that we'd get together and get together and have an evening on the beach. And uh, that was a lot of fun. We had Vision Lab reunions. The last one we had was just a few years ago at uh, one of my colleagues, retired colleagues, Jess Deegan in psychology, who started as a Vision Lab student, came back, became chair of the department, and, uh, and has retired, but he moved to Colorado, and we had a reunion there. And people drove from Washington State and California and here and there to come to that reunion. Did a lot of work right from the get-go. That involved Ed Suzaki also with uh, developing facilities and getting equipment. We didn't, didn't have any facilities, equipment. I mean, there's, as you know, there's no, there's no psychology building at, uh, on campus. So our facilities have always been renovations of existing existing facilities and over the years we we've had uh, four major renovations that I coordinated at first with uh, Ed Suzaki was participating but then he became a full-time administrator and then I was doing it uh, that yielded it was almost always involved taking big rooms and cutting them up and to make a bunch of small rooms so they would be psychology labs where we could take our mysterious equipment and sit down and collect data. Um, we also acquired quite a bit of equipment. We had to get it someplace and there were uh, grants to participate in. And so I was responsible for that also. But I did that from the early 1970s until I, uh, till I retired. People, I remember a lot of people, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start Mentioning that, I guess I could go high school students. Two, I have two, I have two friends on Facebook who are who were high school students in the National Science Foundation programs in the 1970s. They have since retired, but they're friends on Facebook. Um, so many college students, I mean, students that uh, you know you make friends with, and, and uh, you hope you had a good impact on and you learn, learn things from students as well, faculty colleagues uh, that I team taught with. I team taught with some people in psychology also. And staff, admin in psychology, the grasp office, uh, technicians. You know, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time with those folks over the years.
so anyway, uh, I guess that is a is a look at what happened after that chain link fence. <laughs>